Praise the Lord. I want to also echo that it has been such a blessing to be with all of you this past weekend, getting to know different people here, fellowshipping, and being a part of the commission conference this weekend. I love the idea of coming together to infuse the passion that Jesus already has to see people come to know Jesus, for us to be joining with the Lord on the mission that God is doing. I mean, it's amazing to think that God wants us to partner with him. And I can tell you from the time I was young, I I was so stirred in my heart that God wants to take vessels like us and use us for his glory to expand his kingdom. And it has been an amazing adventure as Pastor Kevin was just sharing uh, about the journey the Lord has taken myself and my family on. Uh, We've just come back to the States over these last few months. And I kind of feel like, to be honest with you, like we are missionaries coming back to our home country. Feeling like God wants to do a fresh work in this nation again. And we need to see God awaken us as the church to, to be active participants in what God is wanting to do in these days. Uh, I'm so thankful, so humbly thankful that the church we left behind in Cambridge is now being led by the British leadership we raised up, amen, in the heart of Cambridge, England. And so we praise the Lord for that. And I, my heart is always stirred to, to be talking with the brothers that are over there. And, you know, once you live in a place and you invest time and your energy and your heart somewhere, you know, you're always feeling a sense of, you know, just burden and concern. When, Paul, when I read Paul's letters, like, oh, how I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ after the places he ministered to, I now have a greater understanding of what Paul's heart was like in that. And so I am so blessed to be with you. It's been a joy getting to know your pastor, Kevin, over these last few years and just building relationship there and the whole leadership team and this church body. I know God has his hand on this church and and, and I pray that you're saying, God, how can I be a part of what you're doing here? Because every one of you is a part of the body. Let me say this. Anybody can be a somebody, but it takes everybody to be the body of Christ. Are you with me? <laughs> That's how you got to see it. We're all in this together. We get to do this mission of God together. And I want to say, you know, right now, as we're sitting here getting ready to hear the word of God, the eyes of the Lord are in this place. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. And we need to have hearts that are saying, God, I want to please you. I want to do your will. I want to do what you're calling me to do. Because as we talk about mission, what we have to realize is that the context of all of God's mission has been in a messy world where things don't happen the way we expect, where things fall apart, where our energy runs out, where people sometimes let us down. We're in a context of life where we need to recognize the Lord is always looking to do redemptive works in messy situations. Are you with me? And so I'd like you to turn with me this morning to John chapter two, because this is a wonderful story that, that is at the very beginning of the Lord's mission of the Lord's ministry, how God sent Jesus into this world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. And John chapter two is the story of Jesus's first miracle, his first sign to show who he is as the son of God. And so it's a story that always has stirred my heart for seeing what God is able to do in messy circumstances and situations. But we're going to look at it from a fresh set of eyes this morning because what I want you to see in this text today is not just what the Lord does for us, but what the Lord can do in and through us as we examine the early part of his ministry. So John chapter two, we're going to look at the first uh, 11 verses together. It says on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. 
Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Good advice, by the way. <laughs> I don't think you could get better parental counsel than that. Whatever Jesus says, do it. Verse six. Now there was set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Amen. Let's pray and ask God to speak to our hearts. Father, as we've read your word, we believe, Lord, that you are present when we open up the pages of scripture. We believe, God, you are here to speak personally and powerfully to all of our hearts. God, we want to be open before you right now. We pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit wants to say to us this morning. Father, I pray that whatever context of life we find ourselves in right now, whatever mess we might be in, whatever problems we might be facing, we would see the story and see the glory in it that Jesus, you can take any situation and you can work it together for good. That God, you can do the impossible. You can take natural things and do supernatural things with it. And father, it's our prayer this morning that you would just give us a fresh revelation of how we can also join with you on your mission. So Lord, would you speak right now to us. And we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you that we can taste and see that you are good each day. And it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And it's the goodness of God that brings redemption to this world. So have your way right now, we pray in Jesus name and all God's people who agreed said, amen. amen. So be it, let it be done. So as we read this passage in the scriptures, isn't it interesting that the first miracle that Jesus does is at a wedding. God has a plan and a purpose in all the different contexts of life. But a wedding ceremony is truly one of the most joyful and most celebratory occasions for humanity. I mean, we've all been to weddings. Many here are married and we look back on that day with great joy when God brought two people together in holy matrimony. But what's interesting to me is that even in a height of great joy and in times of great celebration, there are things that can go wrong. And the sooner we realize that in this life, things just don't always go according to plan and things aren't always perfect and reading our expectations, you know, the easier it is to adjust and adapt to when life throws those curveballs at you, at you. You know, I love as a pastor to be able to do weddings. I, I love the opportunity to be a part of special occasions like this. But, you know, there was nothing quite like this one where Jesus is invited to the wedding with his disciples. Now, let me just say this. It is always a good thing to invite Jesus <laughs> into your situations. <laughs> in fact, in marriage... One of the problems we have is sometimes we invited him in at one point and then somehow we push him in, out at another point. And Jesus, 
You know, he, he sees things that no one else sees in situations. You know, while everybody else is focusing on one thing, you know, Jesus will look at somebody off to the side. He sees the least, the last, and the lost. In fact, in one of his teachings, he says, when you go to a wedding, don't just go to the front or when you're invited to a special feast. He goes, sit in the back so that you'll be invited forward. Jesus had a lot of teaching around weddings, and rightly so. Do you want to know why? Listen to this. Out of the 1,189 1, chapters in the Bible, out of the 66 books that we read, there are only four chapters in the Bible where there's no context of sin. It's in the first two chapters of the Bible and in the last two chapters of the Bible. Everything else in the Bible is a redemptive plan of how God is restoring fallen man and bringing us into a right relationship with God. But did you ever notice this? In the first two chapters of Genesis, we have a wedding on earth between a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. In the last two chapters on earth, we have another wedding in heaven between Christ and his bride, the church. Amen. Have you ever made this connection that the first wedding was a foreshadowing of the last one and that even the way that God brought the woman to the man is very prophetic. God put Adam to sleep and out of his side, he made a bride. Adam woke up to the woman of his dreams, but it says that he brought the woman to the man. Fast forwarding, we discover that in the latter marriage, in the prophetic marriage, Jesus was put to sleep, but only to death on the cross. And out of his side came the blood and water that produced a new bride. The spear went in, the blood and water came out. Jesus was birthing his church at the cross of Calvary. And so in the same way that the woman was brought to Adam in the beginning, we discover in the end, the bride will be brought to Jesus in the end. Are you with me? Amen. Isn't that awesome? You see, from the beginning to the end, like a rainbow of promise is an overarching theme in the Bible of the way that God, the creator wants to become one with his creation. That's the eternal purpose of God. So it's no surprise that when Jesus comes into the world as the bridegroom, his first miracle is going to be performed at a wedding, at a marriage ceremony. And the context is quite interesting because the wedding ceremony had a problem. They ran out of wine. Things didn't go according to plan. It could have been a real uh, dishonoring and disappointing thing for the master of the wedding to, to understand what was going on. But Jesus comes and he turns the whole thing around. And, and one of the things you have to see is that God always wants us to see that his whole plan is about the two becoming one. The last thing we read before sin entered the world was that Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed and that the two had become one. What a picture of the time when we are disrobed of our earthly garments and we're put in our heavenly robes of righteousness and we become one with Jesus. And on that day, let me tell you, all the glory of seeing Jesus face to face, of knowing that everything you went through and everything you endured was preparing you for that day when although we don't know what we shall become, we know that when he appears, we shall be just like him for we shall see him as he is, as 1 John chapter 3 says. And this is why Jesus would pray in John 17 that we would be one in him as he's one with the Father. And so there's so many pictures here and I, I love reading the Bible and, and I, when I read the Bible, here's what I want everyone to know is the old is in the new. The new is in the old. Let scripture interpret scripture, then read and behold. We discover so many things when you let the living inspired word of God give you the picture of what Jesus is doing and each scripture puts it all together like puzzle pieces. We see the Bible being such an inspired word. And so on this day, the third day, there was this wedding in Cana. And you know what's interesting is that it says that Jesus's mother was already there. She obviously had some close connections and relationship with those getting married and with the father who, who, who uh, was, was overseeing the wedding feast and the master of the feast. And so it almost seems like Jesus, who's now begun his ministry, is invited due to his connection with his mother. So it says in verse two, Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And I want to say one more point here. Whenever there's a situation that you are going through in life, notice there are two key pieces that you want to invite. Not just Jesus, but his disciples. 
What you're essentially seeing there is that Jesus, who's the head of the church, and the disciples who are the body of Christ, when both are brought in, that's the greatest way for your success, is you invite Jesus into the situation, and you also invite the brothers and sisters, the disciples into a situation. That's why every believer needs Christ in a personal relationship, but needs to be connected to a, a body of believers, a community, uh, and a fellowship a church family, because we need Christ and the disciples. Christ and the disciples. And that's what you see here in verse 2. Jesus and his disciples are invited. In verse 3, we see the problem. They ran out of wine. They ran out of wine. Now, you know, in our day and age, we have a lot of times when we plan things and we, we, we go through things, but then something runs out. You know, for some of you, you're running out of energy. For some of you, you're running out of hope. And that can be a really despairing thing in, in the situation you're in. For some of you, you're running away from solving your problems. You're fleeing, you're escaping, you're suppressing things. For some of you, you're, you're running out of time. You're thinking, oh, I wish I would have started much earlier. And some of you are thinking, my better days are all gone and God's already passed me. And uh, I guess I just kind of got to sit there and just kind of uh, watch other people do the work. Listen, as long as you have breath in you, God has a purpose for your life. And as long as there's people around you, you have a ministry. That's the way I simply look at life. You don't need a position or a title or to be a pastor to be able to fulfill the ministry God's called you to do. You just need to know that I've got a sphere of influence. I'm breathing, so God's got a plan. And there's people around me, so I have a ministry. And you see, brothers and sisters, that changes your scope of mission. Because you see, whatever you think you're running out of, invite Jesus in. Invite the disciples and you'll discover your gifts will come out. As you pursue love, those gifts will follow and, and God will show you and you'll discover what God wants to accomplish through your life. It's a beautiful thing. But you see here, we sometimes get so discouraged by what's running out. We think, well, once it's running out, I guess there's really no way for it ever to come back. Ah, but this is where Jesus loves to bring beauty from the ashes. The oil of joy for the morning and the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Jesus loves that context when you feel like you're running out. In fact, sometimes we don't get to really run forward until we run out. And sometimes in order to go forward, you need to go back and rediscover things that you once learned along the way. That's what Jesus says to the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter two. He says, I know all your works, but you've, you've, I've got this one thing against you. You've left your first love. So he says, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do your first works again. In other words, go back in order to go forward. So as we go back to the first miracle of Jesus, we discover that Jesus is going to start to, uh, you know, reveal himself, but it's in a very unique way. It's not Jesus who initiates right away the solution. Mary, who of course, as we know, had been living a life where a lot of people have been talking about Mary. Hey, you know Mary, you know the one that had the baby, you know, out of wedlock and, you know, all this stuff. Not everybody knew about the virgin birth. Not everybody understood that her child was the Messiah. And so Mary was always hoping that Jesus would kind of prove who he is. Come on, Jesus. He's now 30 years old. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we forget this part. We think about godly Mary, and then we, we go right to Jesus, who's the son of God, and we forget a 30-year gap took place where you can imagine Mary going, come on, Jesus, get on with it already. <laughs> Show yourself. Show yourself who you are. And so, you know, you can imagine Mary's anticipation, her eagerness to see something happen. And so what's interesting is that she speaks up. And she tells Jesus, hey, Jesus, they, ha they have no wine. Nod, nod, wink, wink, hint, hint. <laughs> Jesus, they have no wine. Now, I know who you are. You know who you are. Show yourself. And so Jesus says something very interesting in verse four. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Now, by the way, when he says woman there, we would never speak like that to our mothers, you know, and so forth. But it actually... In, if you're reading the original language, it's a very affectionate and just term of endearment. It, it, it's, it's, it's more like a, a beloved, you know, term. It's not like a, she's a stranger, but he's like, you know, woman, what, what does your concern, mom, what, what does your concern have to do with me? And then Jesus shows us how he runs the course of his life. My hour has not yet come. In other words, I do things according to the father's leading. Jesus says, I only do the things the father tells me to do. 
I only speak the, the words the father gives me to speak. See, Jesus was so in line with the father. He wasn't shaken or overtaken by the situations that he found himself in. He didn't feel the pressure to perform and he didn't feel the pressure to do things out of alignment with God's plan. Oh, how we could learn from Jesus. How we could just learn to be patient, to learn to wait for the leading of God on things. So Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. Now this will repeat throughout the ministry of Jesus. And we discover that the hour Jesus was referring to would, would later on be referred to when Jesus was going to the cross of Calvary. And then he finally says at the garden of Gethsemane, he's like, my hour has now come. So we discover that the whole major purpose of Jesus's life and ministry was actually to die on the cross for us to lay down his life. As he says in John 12, unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much grain. See, Jesus came to the earth as the only begotten of the father, but he left the earth as the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus's death reproduced a whole new people, a whole new nation, a whole new uh, identity that we are no longer who we once were connected to Adam. We're now connected to Christ. We're a new creation where the old things have passed away and all things have become new. And so every day we have to renew ourselves to the newness of who we are in Jesus. And that's what's so key is he, so Jesus has a time in which he does things in which he, he ministers. And so we look at verse five and it says, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. You know, when you stop and think about how you're going to get out of a mess or how you're going to go into the plans and purpose that God has for your life. Jesus once said in Matthew chapter four, verse four, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. See, when Jesus speaks, it releases the potentiality for all the things that God wants to accomplish. We have to hear the word. And the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing the word, by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we can't have faith until we get some basis for our faith. We need to hear the voice of God. We need to listen to what the scriptures are saying to us. And then God moves on our hearts and stirs us up. Because let me tell you something. When you read the word, the word is reading you. And as the word is reading you, it's searching you. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents or intentions of your heart. So what happens is, is when I'm reading my Bible every day, it's the only thing that gives me a mirror for what's really going on inside of me. I read the word and I, and I converse with the Lord and I pray with the Lord as I'm reading. What are the things that God you're communicating to me as I read this passage of scripture? And the Lord meets you wherever you are in the word. You know, wherever you're reading through, you'll find God will meet you there. He will minister to you in that place. You know what I'm talking about? Isn't the Lord so personal? And he's so faithful to give us what we need. Because, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that just keep running out in our lives. You know, in fact, there's two things that I want you to know you can always be sure of in this fallen earth. Two things, entropy and mortality. Entropy is when things run out in a closed system, everything starts winding down and we see things get old and, and things sort of decompose. Mortality is people are dying out. We know that life has a certain number of days and it's running out. So you have this entropy and mortality. Well, the Bible says the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So the word will go far beyond whatever seems to be running out. And then furthermore, we discover that Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? For what can man give in exchange for his soul? So we discover the two things that are often running out take you right back to the cross where everything is turned upside down. At the cross of Calvary, Jesus begins to put things back together, reversing the entropy idea. Jesus begins to give you life where you were once in death. And so what's beautiful is it's not that Jesus just adds days to your life. He adds life to your days. <laughs> Jesus says, I've come to give you life 
and that more abundantly. And so this is where we're at in the story. And we're in such a position today where, listen, the enemy is always looking to get you to miss what God is doing. You see, have you noticed that all the things we're dealing with in our secular society today is an attack on the foundations that God first started with? You know, the confusion that we're seeing today on so many levels in marriage, in gender, in so many issues, they're all things that actually the enemy has attacked from the early foundations. And this is what the Bible says in Psalm 11, verse three, it says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? What a question for us to consider today. In a weekend called Commissions, on a Mission Sunday, and we're thinking about what can the righteous do? Well, first of all, I'll tell you what we need to be aware of. The foundations are being destroyed. And Jesus says, I'll tell you two people, the wise man and the foolish man. The wise person hears the word of God and does it, and he's like a man who builds his house on the rock, right? And the foolish man, he's like the man who builds his house in the sand. Do you notice this? Both the foolish man and the wise man both build a house, and they both hear the word of God. The wise man hears it and does something with it. The foolish man hears it and does nothing with it. In both cases, the rains descend and the flood comes and the wind blows and beats on the house. But in one case, the house stands and in another case, the house falls. It all has to do with foundations. And so one of the things we have to be on mission for is to restore and rebuild foundations. We need to see broken families made whole again. We want to see people be restored in in their relationships whether it be husband, wife, father, son, father, daughter, mother, son, whether it be friendships that have fallen out. We are in the ministry of reconciliation together. Amen. We want to see God make whole what's been torn. We want to see God heal what's been severed. We want to see God turn the water to wine. We want to see God do these things. And so we need to come alongside the Lord in what he's doing. Because let me say this, in every crisis, it comes down to one thing. Listen to this. A crisis is when you're not seeing who Christ is. <laughs> Whenever you're in a crisis, your eyes got to get on Jesus because when you see who Christ is, that's the only way to get out of the crisis. And so we have to look unto Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith. And so now what I'm going to do is our Bible study is going to take a little turn right now. After looking at this whole context of marriage, after understanding who Jesus is and what he's able to do, I'm now going to turn this from a different angle. And I want you to start looking at the rest of this narrative as a way that the Lord doesn't just do something for us, but the way that he wants to do something in and through us. You're going to see something in this text that's just going to come alive to you as we search out this portion of the scripture. And the first one is found... In verse six, take a look. It says, now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Interesting. Let's stop and consider this for a minute. There are six water pots of stone that are empty, that are sitting there. They're in position, not being used. They normally have a function to provide purification of the hands and of the feet of the people. But these six water pots, which are sitting there, Jesus is very aware of. See, Jesus sees the things that no one else is seeing. And he can use the things that nobody else thought would be used. And so the six water pots that are sitting there immediately take my attention to why six? Well, we know that on the sixth day, man was created. And why stone? Well, we know in the book of Ezekiel that God will take out the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, Ezekiel 37. So what we discover is the six water pots of stone, I believe, have a bit more for us to consider than just six water pots of stone. God's going to do a miracle that includes them. So I want to think about them and consider what we can draw from as an application to how God wants to use your life. And that brings up our first point of application today. Number one, we all need to be wholly available to God. In other words, you need to be in position and in place for God to use you where you are. 
Some of you are thinking, in order for me to go on mission, I got to go somewhere. Joey, you went to England, so I guess I got to go to another country. Let me say this. You don't have to go 3,000 miles to fulfill God's mission. You might just need to go three steps out of your house and meet your neighbor. Amen. You might need to be a little bit more available when you go to buy your coffee in the coffee shop that maybe the person behind the counter just needs to be encouraged. Or, or maybe somebody, you know, on your block or, or, or in your life or, or in your school or workplace is going through something and you need to have the eyes to see with God's eyes what he could do in the situation. See, the six water pots of stone are just empty vessels sitting there waiting to be used. It's been said the greatest ability for God is availability. I would say there's one ability greater than that. The greatest ability for God is a person who understands their inability. See, a, a water pot of stone can't do anything unless another pair of hands touch it. See, a, what can a water pot of stone do by itself? Nothing. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So what we need is we need God's hand to come on our life. So the first ability is inability. I can't do it. Then when you realize you can't do it, you open up your hands and say, God, you can do it. So I make myself available. We go from inability to availability. And then we find ourselves in a place of usability. And that's really the title of this morning's message. It's about being fit for the master's use. Most people on January 1st have some kind of New Year's resolution that involves getting fit. But in the church, we need to ask a different question. Lord, let this be the year where I'm fit for the master's use, where I'm spiritually fit and spiritually ready and ready to be obedient to God and ready to step out in faith for God. And whether that's overseas or in your community or in your home, you're on mission already. You just have to receive the mission. Some of you said, I've received Jesus. Praise God. But the moment you receive Jesus, you've also received the church family because Jesus doesn't want you to walk solo. No solo lone rangers in the body of Christ. <laughs> Jesus wants you a part of a body connected so you can be affected by each other and so that you can do things on mission together. See, life's going to be challenging at times. You know, it's been said, whether the weather be cold or whether the weather be hot, we'll be together, whatever the weather, whether we like it or not. So <laughs> the reality is, the reality is, is that, listen, we can't just let the storms of life and the seasons of life dictate and define who we are. We've got to join together. When somebody's hurting, the Bible says when one member of the body suffers, we, we all suffer. And when one member of the body's rejoicing, we all rejoice. So being available is being available together. Oswald Chambers, who wrote My Utmost for His Highest Devotional, great devotional, he said this quote, the greatest hindrance of our spiritual life lies in looking for big things to do. Jesus Christ took a towel. We are not meant to be illuminated versions. We're meant to be the common stuff of ordinary human life, exhibiting the marvel of the grace of God, end quote. See, you don't know how normal and how natural Jesus really wants you to live life. But he wants you to do it in such a supernatural way with his love and compassion that you take ordinary things and you see extraordinary results. You know, it doesn't take much to be a blessing to people. But if you allow yourself to be available, God can do so much through your life. I love what 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 says. We have a verse for this. It says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, we should be filled with the Lord and fulfilled by the Lord because he's the treasure in our life. And when we allow Jesus to have his way in us, we can find ourselves being wholly available. Some of us want to be partially available. Like, God, I'll give you Sunday morning. Come on, you know, Sunday morning, I can do that. I'll show up on a Sunday. Let me just tell you this. God doesn't look at church as attending. A lot of people show up to church but a lot of people don't grow up in church because God doesn't attend. He doesn't intend for you just to attend. He intends for you to be changed and for you to catch a vision for you to be equipped. The reason why we give space and place to teach the scriptures is because as a pastor, we are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, which means if the work of ministry isn't happening, I'm not satisfied and the Lord's not satisfied. 
It's not just that you heard the word and said, Joey, that was a good word this morning. Or Pastor Kevin, man, you brought it this morning. Great word, great message. That's not what we want to see. We want to see hearers of the word becoming doers of the word who learn to make disciples for the Lord. And we have to do that as a community together on mission together. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 to 21, Paul says, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work. You see, we want to be useful to the master. Pastor Chuck Smith, my first pastor, whenever people would say, Chuck, how can I pray for you? I remember hearing him say this over and over again. He said, you know what you can pray for me? Pray that I'll remain usable for the Lord. That's what he used to pray. And I love that because the idea isn't just that we have our salvation. Let me say this. Listen, everybody, very carefully to this. It was God's obedience. It was Christ's obedience that led to your deliverance. But it's your obedience that leads to your influence. God's obedience led to your deliverance. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. But once we have his gift and we have his grace, we want to use the reality of what's happened to us. We want to respond to the reality of what God has done in us. And we want to go out and we want to share the good news with others and tell people what God's done in our life. So our obedience all of a sudden turns into our influence. C.H. Spurgeon put it this way. And we have this quote. As surely as the man wants his hour, so surely the hour wants its man. Be fit for your work and you'll never be out of it. He went on to say, don't run about inviting yourselves to preach here or there. Be more concerned about your ability than your opportunity. And be more earnest about your walk with God than about either. Brothers and sisters, that's being fit for the master's use. Where every day you are overflowing with the love of God. And that brings us into our second point. The second point is this. We go from the water pots that are available to all of a sudden the command of Jesus in verse 7. Look at what verse 7 says. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And what did the servants do? It says they filled them up to the brim. Did you notice that Jesus said fill up the water pots and they not only responded in obedience, but they also did it to the highest level? What a great picture for us that if we're going to obey the Lord, go all in. You know, we don't want to kind of obey the Lord, but with a heart that's like, oh, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> It's kind of like that, you know, they used to say like, you know, when we, when we think we're submitting, it's like, like, like we, we, we stand up to say, okay, look, I'm submitting, but like inside I'm sitting down, you know, we have a way of doing things where our outward form isn't always matching our inward form. And so therefore we need to make sure our motive is right in our mission. We want to serve the Lord with gladness. We want to be obedient. So this second point that we have here is about this. It's about to be fit for the master's use. We must be fully obedient. We must be fully obedient. I love what 1 John 5, 3 says. For, the, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Do you know that it benefits you and it benefits others when you obey the Lord? Let me put it this way to you. Everybody think about the word commandment for a minute. Command mint. It's a command you're meant to keep. And when a commandment is kept, you'll discover that you'll feel the pleasure of God. You'll see the benefits of how your obedience influences others. I mean, in a sense, all the influence of our life has to do with our obedience or disobedience. Because let me put it to you on the flip side. Your disobedience also has influence. Do not think that your choices only affect you. Your choices affect everybody that you touch. If you're somebody who can't control your anger, that's going to affect the people around you. 
If you're somebody who can't be teachable, oh, you know, as a husband, um, as a married man for 17 years, I realize how important it is for me to be teachable to God because there's things I won't see and things I might be missing about my wife. This is why Peter says, dwell with your wives with understanding as to the weaker vessel, not because they're the lesser vessel, but because there is a, a frame of a woman that God is saying, you men need to be conscious of that. And be sensitive that they're going to think differently. They're going to be differently in that. And, and Peter's saying, dwell with them with understanding. And so as a father, I have a daughter, Madeline. I've told her a few different things. She actually knows I've given her all these things about what to look for in a future man. And the first one is always, you know, um, he's got to love Jesus more than you. Because if he loves Jesus more than you, you'll be loved the way you're supposed to be loved. That's one of the first ones. Then I would say to her, and Madeline, you can't even get married until myself and 15 other pastors agree with the man you're marrying. <laughs> That's number two. And number three, it's, it's, and when you watch his life, see the way he treats his mother, see the way he treats his sister and treat, see the way that he is teachable because you're going to see that patterns in his life are not going to be broken too easily. So you want to see men that are teachable, men that can say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was wrong about that. Or, you know, we need to be teachable. So being obedient has an effect on people around us. And that's why these servants were included in the work of the Lord is God could have just did the miracle by himself, but he called servants to fill up the water pots of stone with the water. And their obedience was actually a part of the miracle. Their obedience was part of what God was doing. Are you with me? That brings up the third point, the third point of this whole thing. To be fit for the master's use, we must be actively believing, actively believing. This is our third point. And what that means is that we need to be willing to believe that God's going to do something with it. Because think about this for a minute. It's one thing to fill up the water pots. Okay, Lord, you want me to fill up the water pots? Okay, fill up the water pots. But you know what happens next? Look at the story. It goes on in verse eight. Jesus said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. Then you say, Joey, I don't get it. What's the big deal about that? You don't understand. The master of the feast has, is fully aware there's no more wine. Pay attention. The master of the feast is aware there's no wine. Jesus tells servants to fill up water pots of stone with water. If you're the servant, you're thinking, I don't want to bring water to the master of the feast. He's going to be like, what's this? I'm not going to serve ordinary water in ordinary vessels to my guests. You see, the servants didn't just obey fully, but they actively believed that somehow as they carried the water pots, God was going to have to do something. Jesus must have convinced them in some way that his words were worth following. Mary said, whatever he says, do it. These servants obviously had a confidence in Mary who had a confidence in Jesus, but they also had a faith that this Jesus was going to pull something off because you wouldn't bring six water pots to the master of the feast if it only had water in it. So they actively believed. And this is what Jesus asked in Matthew 9, verse 28. And Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? This is a question for you right now. In whatever messy context you're in that God's calling you to do mission in, you got to ask yourself this question. Do I believe that God could actually do something here? See, not only does God want you to be obedient, but he wants you to be believing that your obedience will actually count for something. That, that, that your obedience will turn into influence and influence will see God's miracle come to fruition. See, God doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. Are you with me? God wants to use us. And so we need to remember that faith makes a huge difference. The Bible says, Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please God. And anybody who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, here's the final twist in the story. Listen to this. We've seen now that three ways to join with the Lord on mission is to be wholly available, right? To be fully obedient and now to be actively believing. But what's interesting is that look at what happens as the story unfolds. Look at verse nine. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants, they knew. 
The servants who had drawn the water knew. Here's what I learned about this. Only those who are active participants with the Lord will really see things that can only be seen as you're joined with the Lord. In other words, brothers and sisters, there are a lot of things that are going over people's heads and that people are blind to. People can't see what we can see. It reminds me of John chapter 15, verse 15. I love this verse because Jesus is talking to his disciples on the last day before he's going to go to the cross. And he says this, no longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father. I have made known to you. Brothers and sisters, look at the progression if you look at the three points I'm giving you today, be wholly available, be completely obedient, be actively believing, and you look at the people who are involved, you discover we all start off as just a lump of clay. We're just an empty vessel. We get filled with the Lord and we become servants. And as we become servants, we eventually start becoming friends because we start seeing what God is doing and we start getting an intimate relationship with the Lord. This is the beginning of people starting to believe in Jesus and getting close to Jesus. Even the disciples believed after this was done. Even the servants believed that what was happening was actually something they were going, wow, we saw the miracle. But did you ever stop to think about this? For the average person that day, for the majority of the people that were at that wedding, they didn't know where the wine came from. That means when Jesus turned water to wine, Mary knew, the servants knew, his disciples knew, but all the other people were like, oh, we got more wine. Great. They had no idea what took place behind the scene. <laughs> and brothers and sisters, this is how it's going to be. The Bible says it is written, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And then in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10, the next verse, it says, but God has revealed them to us by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. I just want to say in closing today, what mess are you in? What mission is God calling you to fulfill? How is the Lord preparing your life to be fit for the master's use? Are you wholly available to God today? If not, open up your hands today and say, God, I want this year to be a year where you use my life for your glory. You say, Hineni, the beautiful Hebrew word that says, here am I. Send me, fill me, use me. And after you go from being available, you say, Lord, give me instructions. Tell me what you want me to do. Your commandments are commands I'm meant to keep. So show me and instruct me on what I'm supposed to do. And you say, Lord, I want to be fully obedient. I want to be fully obedient. And then you move from that and saying, God, I believe that my obedience is going to cause influence. I believe that you're going to take even the smallest things you're asking me to do and somehow you'll work it together for good. Somehow you'll turn the water into wine. Somehow you will do your miraculous works. Brothers and sisters, God always saves the best for last. At the end of this feast, the master's like, wow, this wine's even better than the beginning. Nobody ever does this. And that's how the Christian life goes and grows. It gets sweeter and better as you go further along because one day we're going to see the Lord face to face and all of that availability and all of that obedience and all of your believing is going to amount to the glory of God. And you're going to say, oh, I just wish I would have done more for you if I had the opportunity in light of your glory, Lord. And I want to just close with this verse, Revelation 22, verse 17. It says, in the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come and let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. You know why brothers and sisters? Because when God sees the water, he sees the wine. When God sees the pots, he sees the servants. When God sees your faith, he sees the end result. And God is a beautiful miracle working God. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our hearts together before the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, God, that we can be vessels that are fit for your use. 
We ask you, Lord, to do a work in our hearts where we will do our part in the mission that you are wanting to accomplish in this world. Father, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit? Would you give us eyes to see things that you see? And would you give us those clear instructions that we would know what we're called to do? And we would take one step of faith at a time. That even when we don't see the results, and even though we can't see what's happening, that God, we would believe even now you're somehow, some way working all things together for good. Let us say today that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, we invite you into the mess and we ask you to send us into the mess as well. We want to be faithful and obedient servants, Lord. But that begins by first just being a child of God who's forgiven and set free. Father, I ask you right now, if there's anybody here that just needs to be cleansed by the watering of your word, as we've heard today, needs to be renewed in the spirit of their minds, that God, you would just do a deep work in us to change our priorities, to rearrange the way we're living and to exchange our strength for your strength. God, we ask you to just have your way in us. And Lord, lead us in the way everlasting. Lord, let our hands and our feet be used for your purposes. We pray you'd make us fit for you, our master, for your use. Lord, have your way in us. Work through us. May we see water turned into wine around our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. And for your glory, amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. <laughs>